All right. So tonight, um, yeah, I'm I'm excited, and I feel like just everything really, it's really piggybacking off of everything Pastor Nate said and Mona said. So um, let's pray before we get into the word, okay? Father, we just love you so much tonight. We thank you that your presence is here. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you always accompany the word. So we thank you tonight that you are present. And as the word goes forth, we thank you that we won't just be hearers, but we'll be doers of your word. We thank you for the grace to do. The grace to do your word. And we have eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can everyone just say that tonight? I have ears that hear and a heart that understands. Amen. Amen. Every time you go to the word, that should be your expectation, is that you have ears that hear, eyes that see, and a heart that understands. How many of you know God's word shouldn't be difficult? And God's word's not boring. God's word is life. But you know what? If we go into the word like it's boring or it's hard, guess what you're going to get out of it? Right. But if we go into it expecting and knowing that this is the only book on planet Earth that is alive and speaking. Amen. The word of God. It's powerful. Okay. So tonight we're going to talk about, and the title of my message is My Good Shepherd. Can you say that tonight? I almost said this morning, tonight. My good shepherd. You have a good shepherd. We're going to talk about him tonight. So I want to talk um, first because really this is kind of, um, I feel like it kind of goes along with the series that we've been in on Sundays with Pastor Nate of Brighter and Brighter. And how many of you know that is God's path that is God's plan for us is that it is brighter and brighter. Proverbs 4.18. And in order for us to know and to understand that God's path for us is brighter and brighter, it takes knowing the character of God, knowing who he is. Because how many of you know, and just like Pastor Nate talked about on week one, the path, I remember he had um, Ben and Joni come up and there was rocks laid out. And how many of you know that sometimes we'll look at the path and it'll cause us to maybe fear or it'll cause us to look at God and say, where are you? Or to wonder certain things. Why? Because we don't know who he is. And what does the enemy like to do? The enemy likes to come in and to mar God's character. To tell you he's not there, to tell you he's not good, to tell you, yeah, last time he remembered you, but you remember what you did, and he's not there this time, and you did this, and you did that. To get you to question God's goodness to you and his faithfulness to you. And so in order for it to be brighter and brighter, we have to understand God's character and who he is. And where we find that, we know is what? Is the word of God. We look to the word to know the will of God and to know the character of God. So let's look at this, Jeremiah 29, 11. And this is a popular verse, probably one some of you have up in your home. But it says this, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Aren't you thankful that God has good plans for us? They're good. Say that. God's plans are good. What is um, cool about this passage of scripture is we look at this verse, but really the context of this passage is God's coming in and he's having to basically say like, hey, this is what people are saying about me or maybe what you're saying about me, but I want to tell you my thoughts. Have you ever been there before where maybe someone is speaking for you or someone is assuming something about you, but you aren't able to say, hey, 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 wait a minute. No, that's not what I mean. That's not what I'm thinking. Maybe someone goes, well, I know that you're just da da da, and you're like, no, that's not, that's not even remotely what I was saying or what I was thinking. This is what God's coming in here in this passage of scripture to say, hey, 
I know the thoughts that I think toward you. God knows his thoughts toward you. And he tells us here, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So the enemy wants to come in to tell you God's thoughts for you. And what it's going to be is not peaceful. And the future that you see is not going to be filled with hope. It's going to be filled with fear or torment or destruction. But how many of you know we have to agree with God's thoughts? What he says about himself, what he says about us. Okay, let's look at, um, at uh, this Acts uh, 10.38. This is another um, just passage of scripture here that's going to talk about God's plan and his will. Acts 10.38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So what do we see here? That Jesus went about doing what? Good. And healing some. Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So if we want to know who God is and his will for our lives, we have to look at the word. His word is his will. And we could go even a step further and say, if we want to know God's will, we need to look at God's son, Jesus, who was God's will demonstrated in human form on planet Earth. And if you've done our daily Bible reading, we're in the book of Acts now, but we got, went through the Gospels. And I can't tell you, practically every day when I was reading through the Gospels, I'm just like, I don't know how people can say God is not a healer. I don't know how people can say that God causes destruction or you just don't know God's will or you have to wonder. Read the Gospels. What did Jesus come to do? He came to say and to demonstrate the will of God. So let's say this together. His word reveals his will. So what do we see here? Jesus went about doing what? Good. And healing all. All. All means all. Okay, let's look at this. Matthew 8, 2 through 3 says this. And behold, a leper came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him and said, mm, I'll think about it. No, what did he say? I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. So what do we see? Someone came to Jesus and said, they didn't doubt his ability. It, it said right here, because you can make me clean. They didn't, this leper didn't doubt God's ability to heal him. But he was questioning if he'd be willing to heal me. And what did Jesus say? Not only am I able, I'm willing. And you know what? Probably this man, in struggling to understand if Jesus would be willing to heal him, was because he was ate up with shame and guilt, maybe stuff that had gone on in his life where he was like, I've done some bad stuff in my life. But what did Jesus still come to say? I'm willing. This is God's will for mankind. Healing is God's will. Provision is God's will. God is good. So Jesus said this, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The, the Bible also tells us that Jesus was the express image of God. So when we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, every word and action from Jesus was a demonstration of the will of God. I only came to do the will of my Father. So when I look at Jesus, I find the will of God for my life. And we see Jesus. What was he willing to do? What did he do? He healed. He saved. He delivered. He prospered people. When there wasn't enough of something, he made more than enough. Right. 
So, not everything in planet Earth that is happening is the will of God. People are using experience or lack of experience to determine what the will of God is. But what did we just go over? What is the will of God? His word is his will. So, you may have experienced this in your life. I know I have. Someone's believing for healing and they get healed. And then there's another person who's believing for healing, and they don't get healed. And when these two scenarios happen, then guess what people say? Well, I guess we just don't know what God's will is. Eat. Eat. Wrong answer. My experience or someone else's experience does not determine the will of God. People may say, well, I guess he just chooses to heal some, and I guess he just chooses not to heal some. No, because that's not what the word says. That's not what his will is. Some people, you know, just have it good in life, and he prospers them, and other people, you know, you just never know. Well, frankly, I don't want to serve a God like that, where you just never know. A good shepherd A good shepherd is dependable. A good shepherd is good. You know. People say, well, it's just up to his mysterious plan. You just don't know his mysterious plan or his mysterious will. His will is not mysterious. His will is right here. His word reveals his will. So, tradition of men, someone's experience or lack thereof does not determine the will of God. So, this is just super foundational, super foundational, because traditions of men, experiences, and the enemy are going to try to talk you out of the will of God for your life. Okay, let's look at Colossians um, 1.9, and this is in the Amplified. It says this, For this reason we also, from the day we heard of it, have not ceased to pray and make special requests for you, asking that you may be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom. And the Amplified says, In comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God, and in understanding and discernment of spiritual things. So guess what? You can know the will of God. You can know the will of God through his word. You can know the will of God for your, for your life, the plan of God for your life. This is a great passage of scripture and even several verses down for you to use as a confession of your faith. That I may be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of his will. He wouldn't tell you that you could be filled with the knowledge of his will if it was mysterious or unattainable. Jesus said this, Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Again, Jesus only said and demonstrated what the will of God was. So what was the will of God here? That he was anointed to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor, which means you don't have to be poor. Because when the gospel comes, poorness has to go. He sent me to do what? Heal the brokenhearted Not look at the brokenhearted and hope that someday they can be okay. Heal the brokenhearted. Proclaim liberty to the captives. That means people who are bound up by religion or tradition or whatever it might be, be set free. Recovery of sight to the blind, that sickness and disease. Set at liberty those who are oppressed. This is good news. And the devil wants to get people who are born again believers. If he can't get you, you know, you're already born again. But if he, if you're already born again and he can keep you still bound 
living life here on this earth, like, yes, praise God, we're going to heaven, but to live an abundant life here on this earth is what God intended. And if the enemy can convince you that God's not for you, that he's not good, that your body's not supposed to be healthy, that you're not supposed to be poor, that you're not supposed to live bound up by oppression and depression, he's going to try to do that. But what do we have to go to? Lord, what does your word say? And your word says, I am healed. Your word says, I'm made rich. I'm prosperous. And that's not just talking about money. Money's a part of that. But that spirit, soul, body, every part of me prospering in every way so I can be a blessing to others. And we're going to look here at the good shepherd, but if you, you know, Jesus references himself in John 10, and then we're also going to look at Psalms 23, but as the good shepherd, and how many of you know, sheep reflect what, how good a shepherd is. If you heard of a fantastic shepherd and you couldn't wait and you've just heard all about this shepherd and how amazing he is and awesome. And so you're waiting and the shepherd comes down the street with the sheep and they're like, limping and mangy and would you be like I thought he was a good shepherd would you look at the sheep or would you look at the shepherd so the world is looking at the sheep us God's people and if we're mangy and broke down and it's not speaking well of our good shepherd And this is not to say that you don't have situations in life that hit you. This is not to say that you just go through life on, Brother Hagen would say, flowery beds of ease, where nothing ever comes your way. But this is saying, when I stick with the good shepherd, when I know his will, when I have his word, I can get through anything. And I can come through victorious. Okay, now let's look at, um, actually, I want to define this, okay? Um, But yeah, let's look at John 10. We'll do that. John 10, and uh, we'll just start in verse 1. It says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things for which he had spoke to them. So one of the greatest things that we can do is agree with God. And what did he say here? That you know his voice. If you've received Jesus, you are his sheep. He is your shepherd. You know his voice. This is one of the greatest things you can instill into your children. You know the voice of your good shepherd. So never say, I can't hear from God. Regardless of your situation, regardless of pressure that may be there, regardless of how confusing life may be, how you may feel, agree with what God says. I know the voice of my good shepherd. And you know what? Sometimes in the circumstances of life and when things are going 90 to nothing and a million miles an hour, and how many of you know Brother Keith talks about this, but like when the enemy comes, he's not just typically throwing one thing at you. It's like he'll just keep piling it on to try to what? To just weigh you down, load you down, get you in a panic, get you to react. And you know what? Sometimes you just need to stop, calm your mind, sit for a second and say, I know the voice of my good shepherd. And as strangers, I don't follow. Pastor Nate says this all the time, that that the enemy wants to come with a question. He wants to come with pressure. He wants to make, make you make a decision 
quickly and force you into something. God is not a driver. He's a leader. The enemy will drive you. But take a moment and just pause and think of your good shepherd. Let your mouth reflect that you know his voice. And as strangers, I don't follow. Partner with him and what he says about you. So let's just take a minute and say that. I know the voice of my good shepherd. Let's say it again. I know the voice of my good shepherd. Okay, and we'll keep reading here. Verse 7. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Aren't you thankful? Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door, and we go in and find green pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So like we've talked about, the enemy wants to do what? To mar God's character. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God, good, devil, bad. Sometimes we overcomplicate stuff. Or because there's questions, it causes us to then find someone to blame. How many of you know, you want to find when situations are going on and you don't have an answer for it, human, flesh, and nature wants to blame someone or something. Well, guess what? The devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Nowhere in the word of God do you see where it says that God comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Only the devil. So if there is stealing, killing, and destroying going on, assign it to the right person. God's goodness and kindness draws people. And this is why Satan wants to do everything he can to try to mar and to hide that God is good and that he is kind. Because that's how the, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Okay, so we see here two completely different characteristics in this passage of scripture. God is a good shepherd. We know his voice. He gives us green pasture. And then what does it say? The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So we see here that the devil is a thief. And all through scripture, you can see this. He's accompanied by darkness. He is selfish. He has no love in him, no good, no peace. He's a taker. The devil is a taker. God is what? He is light, all light. There is no darkness. He is life. He is the giver of life. His very nature is giver. He is love. He does not take. He does not steal. So from this, you can learn what to resist and what to yield to. If they're stealing, killing, and destroying, I resist that because that's the enemy. But I can yield to the Spirit of God who is loving and giving. I can yield to the Good Shepherd. Okay, so we see here that God is good and the enemy comes to take. But how many of you know there is people and Christian people who say God put cancer on them? or on a loved one, or someone they know, or a storm came, and this is God's will, or a baby dies in a car wreck or some freak accident, and I guess they just needed another angel in heaven. But then follow that by saying, don't you want to be saved and born again and a part of the flock and 
our good shepherd? No. God is not a taker or a stealer. He is love and he is good. So when something happens that is stealing, killing, or destroying, like we said earlier, assign it to the right place. That is the enemy. That is not God. The Amplified of John 10, 10 says this, the thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. This is God's plan for you, that you may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. He's not just a good enough. He's overflowing, overflowing life, overflowing abundance. So when you read the word of God and you see the nature of God and his goodness and his love, it pushes out wrong thinking and wrong traditions. I mean, when we were reading through the gospels, I was thinking anyone who, who truly believes that God puts sickness or you just never know the will of God, like, I really question if you've read your Bible or if you've just taken experience or traditions. Because it's all through the word. And his word is his will and it renews our mind and pushes out wrong things. So I didn't bring it because I didn't really want to wreck the stage. But just think if I had a glass of dirty water here and it was filled up to the brim. And that's like what our mind is. What does Romans 12 tell us? That we need to renew our mind to the word of God. That means when you were born again, your spirit was recreated and new. But guess what? Your flesh was not. Your mind was not. So you have to renew your mind to the word of God because the way you thought before you were saved, if you don't renew your mind to the word after you're saved, will still be the same thinking. But the word of God has the ability and the power to renew. And that word actually means transform. That means not even look the same. Our mind, where we begin to think God's thoughts, where we begin to know his will. This is the power of the word. So if we take our mind and think of it like a a dirty glass of water, and we take God's word and pour it into our mind and just keep pouring and pouring and pouring, what's eventually going to happen? That glass is going to overflow And all of that dirty water, as long as that water, fresh water, keeps pouring into that dirty water glass, what's going to happen? It's going to become clean. It's going to become, you could say, new. This is what the word of God does to tradition, to religion, to wrong ways of thinking. It flushes out that and puts in God's will and his way, where you begin to see right and think right. Simply by the word. This is why the enemy wants to get you out of the word. And tell you it's boring, it, it's nothing, it's old-fashioned, it's out of date, it's whatever it might be, busyness of life. But when I understand I have to have God's word... <laughs> I can't help but be in the word. This is why like the Bible reading we're doing in the New Testament. Why? Because we have to have the word. Daily, we have to have the word. Otherwise, the enemy and circumstances of life will come in and tell you how to think and what to believe. But if I have a steady diet of the word, it flushes that out. Okay, also, if I don't know that he is the good shepherd, I won't trust him, and I'll stray from him. So we talked about a moment ago, if mangy sheep come walking up, but supposedly this is a great shepherd, we'd either question, there's either two things. It's either A, not a good shepherd, or sheep that are straying. Well, it's not on God's end. Because he's the good shepherd. 
He's 100% good, and he is fantastic, perfectly perfect at his shepherding job. So if there's stuff going on, I need to look at, am I abiding with the shepherd? Am I, am I eating the green pasture? Because oftentimes there is word, whether it's from the pulpit or in my own personal time with the Lord, and I may not like that grass taste. like goat cheese or milk. It just tastes like rotten hay, but it's good for you. I'm just saying there's stuff sometimes that the Lord will come to us with that we have to submit to the good shepherd. And we have to say, you know more than I know. You know the path ahead. (laughs) I don't know the path. Did you know sheep have to have a shepherd? Otherwise those sheep don't last. Like a sheep has to have a shepherd and he's the good shepherd. And if I stick close to him, I'll know his word and his will. If I stray from him, I will not hear his word. And I'll be away like your rod and your staff. will look at this here in um, Psalms 23, but that was there to protect and to guide. The rod was actually a thing where they could beat the animals that would try to come. And then the rod had a hook on it, which would hook the sheep to do what? To bring it back from straying. Well, guess what? If that sheep is like way far away from the shepherd, he's susceptible to stuff. And is that the shepherd that caused that? Or is that the sheep that said, I I know? I know what's best for my life. I know where my green pasture is. This isn't right. But the sheep that stay with the flock, which is why, just like Mona said, the importance of the local church and the, the flock that he's called you to is so important because there's safety there. But also with the shepherd, there's safety there. There's protection there. There's life there. Like, what's amazing is those sheep reproduce when they're healthy. Healthy things reproduce. God's desire is for more sheep to be added to his flock. Okay. So let's say this. um, The Lord is my good shepherd. Let's look at Psalms 23. And we'll read verse 1 here. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. You could just stop there, really. (laughs) The Lord is my shepherd. He's not just a shepherd. He's my shepherd. He's my good shepherd. We saw in John 10. So we could say this, the Lord is my good shepherd. I will not want. That can be translated, I shall not lack. So what does this tell me? All the provision, all of the word, all of everything that I need is with my good shepherd. By my good shepherd, staying hooked to my good shepherd, staying hooked to the flock that he's called me to. And our high priest works with what we say. It tells us that he is the high priest of our confession. So the Lord will be to you what you say he is to you. He is the best shepherd. So because the Lord is my shepherd, this sheep... You could say you, this sheep, will never do without. I will not lack. I will not want. But you know what? These promises of God don't just fall on you. How do we receive anything from God? By faith. And how is faith activated? By our mouths.
And we talked about this, that sheep need a shepherd. They have to have a shepherd on their own. They won't make it. Um, the Weiss translation of, of um, Psalms 23, 1 says this, I am the shepherd, the good one. Isn't that awesome? He is the shepherd. He's the good one. So stay with the shepherd and he will take care of you. And I love that this says, you shall not want or you shall not lack. There's no maybe, there's no we'll see. I shall not want. I shall not lack. Okay, let's go to verse 2. And it says this, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. This is peaceful. Green pastures, that's where you're fed. That's where you're satisfied. That's where you're fulfilled. Okay, verse 3. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores your soul. Say that. He restores my soul. So this is a reflection of the kind of shepherd that you have. He's leading me. He's guiding me. He's directing my path. I'm his sheep and I know his voice. And the devil will do everything he can to shock you, shake you, distress you, and get you to say, I don't know what I'm going to do. This situation, this circumstance, fear, panic, dread, he's always coming to try to steal. Or what we talked about earlier, to take. He wants to take. Well, how do we give him access to take? Through the words of our mouth. So when I'm saying, I don't know what to do, I'm not hearing right, this situation, whatever, I'm giving him access to come and to steal. But instead, when I partner with and say God's word, which we know is his will, I do know the voice of my good shepherd, then you partner with God. And you close that door on the enemy. So let's agree with God. Let's say what he says. Okay, so um, verse 3 there says, he restores my soul. So this is a picture of wholeness. This isn't just kind of fixing something. Restoring means taking, like, there's all this HGTV and DIY and stuff that's come out in the last few years. Well, what do they like to do? They like to take something and totally restore it and make it new. This is what God can do for your soul. He can restore it. So we don't have to walk around saying, I'm so broken. I'm so, I'll always be this way. Or this was in my family line or whatever. He restores my soul. You don't have to carry around emotional scars. God can heal you. He can restore you. And how many of you know restored is not the same as broken? Can God restore anything? I'll say it again. Can God restore anything? Bodies, relationships, finances, you name it, he can restore it. What about if it's been 20 or 30 years? Can he restore it? But what do you have to do? You have to agree with him. Okay, Psalms 23, 4. And Chris, you can come up and play if you don't mind. That'd be awesome. Verse 4 um, says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So what do we know? Just like what we talked about earlier. This isn't saying you're never going to hit anything hard. This isn't saying that there's not going to be circumstances or situations that come up that want to pull you and that are dark and hard. But what does it say? I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I don't have to fear evil. Why? Because he's with me. 
Because he's my good shepherd, I know I'm going through. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Again, this speaks to closeness like we talked about before. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Verse 5. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Not just brimming. My cup runs over. He anoints your head with oil. Wow, what a picture. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So you can be, what did we see here? Free from fear, your soul restored, there's provision there, there's protection there, everything is there with your good shepherd. But what do we have to do? We have to agree with him. We have to use the words of our mouth. And this is a great passage of scripture to quote and to say, Lord, you are my good shepherd. I do not want. You restore my soul. You make me lie down in green pastures. Psalms 23 is a promise, but it's also a confession that we can say over our lives. And you know what? is amazing about the word of God is it paints pictures and when you declare the word of God and you meditate on the word of God you begin to see what he says you begin to see different pictures pictures that the enemies may be painted of hopelessness or of fear or of not knowing or whatever it might be but when you begin to declare his word you begin to see differently Aren't you thankful that his word, and then you know what? When you see differently, peace comes, joy comes, expectation comes, hope comes. You're filled with that. Amen. Can we just dim the lights? And um, I want everyone to stand up, please. And can you turn the keys up, if you don't mind? And this was a song, um, I'm actually, I was just going to have Chris play, but I think I'm actually going to sing it. And I don't want you um, looking at me. I want you closing your eyes because I saw this song being played, and I want to kind of give some background on this song. So this, you've probably heard it, um, but this is Sarah Pearson's song. And back years ago, back in like 2012, 2013, I was hit with just major anxiety, depression, all kinds of stuff, just a very dark time. And I remember just crying out to the Lord. And one of the things he told me was whenever, whatever I tell you to do, whether it's to sing, to confess the word, whatever it is, just do that. And I'll bring you out. And it wasn't immediate. It wasn't immediate. But you know what? I can look back and I'm so thankful. And I can truly say he is my good shepherd and he brought me out. But you know what it was? Pausing to reflect and to listen to him and what he said. And one of the other things that he told me, which I've said this a lot um, ministering, but You know, I, uh, that anxiety and depression wants to get you so focused just on yourself, totally inward, which is, which is the enemy's plan to get you just to focus on yourself. And I remember just like knowing that I needed to, one of the keys was thankfulness. And so I remember just at that moment, which sounds so crazy. I remember looking out of our, um, master bedroom and just thanking the Lord for the grass, thanking the Lord for the smallest things, because that's all I could do. But then it began to, thank you, but then it began to grow and get, and get bigger. And I remember I told, I um, would go to church and the Lord would tell me, I want you to not be focused on you. I don't even want you like I don't want to say I wasn't coming to church expecting because I was, but I'm saying I wasn't coming to church just like, oh my gosh, I got to get something. 
I came to church like, Lord, what can I do to bless someone? What can I do to tell them? What I would buy gifts for people when you tell me. I'd write them notes. I'd, I'd look, what, what do you want to say to someone? Because I knew I had to get my eyes off myself. Um, so I did that. And then I remember we moved out of our house and we moved into a rental. And I had a um, just like a really old piano. And it wasn't even tuned. <laughs> but um, I would play it. And this song I would play. And what's so crazy is I just remember the Lord telling me, you need to sing this song, which is so funny because you would think at the time, because of the words of it, that I would know that it was for what I was dealing with, but I didn't. I just knew every day he told me, I want you to do it every day until I tell you to stop. So I would, it wasn't at necessarily the same time every day, but I would do it and I would just sing the song. And now looking back, I'm like, that was so, that was so God. And this song is so word. Really what I was singing was the word, it was the, it was Psalms 23 to music. And I looked back and saw he didn't, he didn't just heal, he restored. He restored everything. He made it right. And like I said, it wasn't instantaneous. It was a couple year journey, but I'm here to say he brought me out and he restored. And so I just felt tonight that there, and I know it's 8.30, but just give me like six more minutes. I want to. I want us to just receive from this song. And I'm probably going to, I'm actually just going to go stand by Chris because I don't even want you looking at, at me or anything. I just want you to hear this song and I want you to receive. And for some of you, you maybe say, I'm, I'm not battling like oppression and depression or whatever. It doesn't matter. He's your good shepherd. Whatever it is, it could be fear. It could be finances. It could be wondering what's next. It could be, Lord, what's your plan for my life? I don't know, whatever it is, but he's your good shepherd. He has everything you need. Amen. <laughs> he's so good and he loves us so much. So just close your eyes. And you'll have to bear with me. I hope I don't cry and can get through this, but just focus on the Lord if I stop, okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me rest in pastures green. Oh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. By waters still he leads me. You restore my soul, you restore my soul.
you, Lord, for every person here, over minds, over bodies, over relationships, over marriages, over finances. We thank you, and we declare out of our mouths that you are our good shepherd. You are my good shepherd. Say that. You are my good shepherd. You've given me life, and you've made me whole. And you know what? For some of you, you need, to, you need to let those words just continue day after day after day. You've gave me life and you've made me whole. Thank you, Lord. So if you do, if you need healing in your body, just raise, I want you to just raise your hand. It could be mental. It could be physical. I just want you just right where you are. You don't have to come up or anything. I just want you to raise your hand. That's just as, as an act of faith healing in any way. So Lord, we just thank you for those whose hands are raised, whether it's mental or emotional or physical. We say you be restored and you be made whole in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus. We say the blood of Jesus. That is our wholeness. It is our victory. We thank you, Lord. We make much of your blood. Just say that. I make much of the blood of Jesus over my past, over my future, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.